Blue singer Bessie Smith died saying, I'm going, but I'm going in the name of the Lord. Tonight, we're going to try to finish the book of 2 Timothy. We're in chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. And really, Paul is about to write his own obituary. Pastor Mark Hensley from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church right here in my office here on El Moro Road. Hope that you're having a good day, a good evening. And uh, let us know where you're from, how we can pray for you. Thank you for praying for uh, my brother-in-law, Gary, who's struggling with deep depression. We're trying to determine what uh, his next chapter is going to be. I think we'll be moving him into an assisted living place. But I'm here with my noted cameraman, Ben. Good to see you, Ben. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege to be here. Thank you that uh, thy word is truth. And your word uh, is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Guide us as we study your word tonight. Pray for those who are going through uh, challenging times that you'd meet all of their needs and guide their steps and give us wisdom with Gary where he needs to go next. And Lord, we just thank you that there, uh, there's no pit so deep that God's love is in deeper still. Thank you. And as we contemplate Paul's uh, a swan song, his obituary, his last will and testament, help it to solidify our determination to be all in for the Lord to our last moment. In Jesus' name, amen. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, we pick up where we left off last week, verse 6 and following. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward me on that day, and not only me, but all those who have loved his appearing. Make every effort to come to me soon, for Demas has loved this present world and has deserted me to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful to me in service. But Titus, I've sent to Ephesus, when you come, bring the cloak, which I left at Troas and Carpus, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, but the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed my teaching. In my first offense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May that not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that he, through me, the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Some last thoughts. Greet Prisca and Aquila. Priscilla or Aquila, and the household of Onesiphorus, Erastus, remained at Corinth. But Trophius, I left sick in Miletus. Make every effort to come before winter. Eusebius greets you, also Prudens and Linus and Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. The Apostle Paul knows his time is short. He's in a Roman prison. He's writing to Timothy, a young man who's trying to develop a church in Ephesus, a pagan city of 350,000 people. And his thoughts are on finishing with integrity, breaking the tape with integrity, finishing strong. I want to finish strong. I want to have lived a life that brought God honor, that honored my family, my, honored my beautiful wife and uh, my sons and my daughter-in-laws. I want to have always honored the people of God and done the best I could in every church I've served. Paul knows his time is at hand. Tony Evans is writing about that. He said it's amazing here because when he says I'm being poured out like a drink offering, the time of my departure is close. Paul uses an Old Testament imagery there where the priests would would pour uh, wine on the brazen altar and the the, of course, wine would just dissipate and uh, flames would go up and, and it was a, a drink offering to God. He's like, my life is like that. Well, John, the beloved disciple, said, our life is like a vapor. It appears for a short time and it vanishes 
away. We're just not here for long. Uh, we're uh, passing through. But while we're here, we can be impactful. And so he said, I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. That's something to aspire to, to have lived a life that honors God. Certainly not a perfect life, but a life that brings him honor. Is there a better life than that? You know, I often tell people, and it's not an original quote with me, George W. Truett, the great uh, pastor of First Baptist Church, Dallas, who served there from 1897 to 1944, 47 years at one church, died at 77, Ben, in the summer of 1944, July. He had bone cancer. Dr. Truett <clears throat> was allergic to any kind of narcotics. Isn't that something? So he was in incredible agony. But he never complained, and he had to gut it out, honestly, because they couldn't give him any kind of real sedation. But he, uh, he said to a, a young man named Louis Newton, who would later become the president of uh, Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, he said, would you please pray for me that I won't lose my witness during this time of agony? And uh, he didn't, and what an example. Uh, we don't know uh, what uh, will befall us in the future, but to, uh, to have this kind of mindset, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. <clears throat> Paul is excited about that. He's excited about where he's headed. He says, I have something to look forward to, and so do you. Your retirement is out of this world. In the future, he says, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which is the Lord, which is serving him, the righteous Lord will award me on that day. And not only to me, but everyone who's loved is appearing. The Bible teaches there's five crowns in the Bible. And I do need to do a sermon series on the five crowns. There's the soul winner's crown. There's the pastor's crown. There's the martyr's crown. There's this crown of those who love his appearing. And I'll have to look up the other crown. But five crowns that you can win for your Lord and then throw them at his feet. This one is for those who really anticipate his coming. When we think what's going on now in Israel with, with Hamas, this terrorist group attacking Israel and Israel retaliating, and if you even look at our own American press, they're trying to suppress uh, Hamas being a terrorist group. They're, they're saying it's more uh, that Israel's fault. Well, it's not. They were attacked. They have one of the greatest uh, defenses in the world. Israel is a, is a small little place and surrounded by 95% Arabs who uh, hate them with a vehement hatred. And if you ever want to watch prophecy, watch what happens to Israel. Can a nation be born in a day? Yes, 1948, Israel became a nation in like one day. Uh, there was, in 1967, what was called the Six-Day War, and Arab forces arrayed against them, attacked Israel, and they were defeated in, hence the name, six days. Blessed is the God who's blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. America has always been an ally to Israel. We need to be, and when our politicians aren't, uh, that could throw us in the crosshairs of the judgment of God. And so uh, we live in precarious times, no doubt about it. Paul's looking past this world to the promise of being with the Lord, and uh, if you have an anticipation for the Lord's return. And you can say with honest desire, even so come Lord Jesus, uh, there's going to be a crown awarded to you that you can cast at the feet of Jesus one day. Make every effort to come to me soon. He realizes his time's short. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me, gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Listen to how it's recorded in the Message Bible. Get here as fast as you can. Demas, chasing fads, went off to Thessalonica and left me here. Cretans is in Galatia province. Titus in Dalmatia uh, with me. Uh, with me, pick up, excuse me, um, Luke alone is with me. Bring Mark with you. He'll be my right-hand man since I'm sending Titus to Ephesus. Bring the winter coat I left in Troas and Carpus. Also, the books and the parchments. This is so interesting. He's, he's saying, I've, I've got some of these folks have left me, some by divine decree, God sent them to another place of service, but some just got uh, uh, tired of the walk, they got tired of the stress, tired of uh, living for God and, and being on the end of persecution. So they just kind of abdicated their responsibilities, kind of left me. 
in the lurch. That how is how Paul feels. But he's uh, saying there's people that you got to bring to me though because I need the help that they can bring. And he references Mark. If we remember the book of Acts that Mark, who was a nephew of Barnabas, got homesick. Don't we all sometimes get homesick? And he left for home and he kind of deserted Paul and that uh, troubled Paul greatly. So when there came another time for a mission trip, Paul basically said, well, I'm not taking Mark. He, he's, he's, he's a turncoat. He, 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 when things got hot, he bailed. But in a proof that failure isn't fatal or final, Mark is being reinstated right here in this text. He's come full circle and now he's very useful. In fact, I like how the message put it. Uh, bring Mark with you. He's very helpful to me. Do you see it? Get here as fast as you can. Um, and so bring Mark. He's helpful. And that's, that's what I want to be. In fact, the message says he'll be my right-hand man since I'm sending Tychicus to Ephesus. And then he, he does a segue, Ben, I find really interesting. He's in a Roman dungeon. It's cold. Um, we're not positive uh, exactly the time of the year, but it's it's def definitely late fall because he, he's making a stressful, a stressful statement. Get here before winter. Come by winter. Two reasons. Number one, he needed his cloak. Most likely, Paul uh, was a tent maker, and not most likely, he was a tent maker, but most likely this is referencing uh, kind of a, think of it like a parka almost, or more of a poncho probably, probably made of goat skin that was quite warm. And you would welcome something like that in a dungeon, right? It'd be like someone dropping down a buffalo hide to you. It'd be like, thank you very much. And so he wants his cloak. He really wants that warmth. Do you see it? But he also says, bring the books, especially the parchments. Paul was a lifelong learner. Now remember, he had a brilliant mind, trained as a lawyer, studied under Gamil, one of the great uh, uh, Jewish rabbis. Uh, Paul was described once by one pastor as having a scintillating mind. He's brilliant. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Thirteen of the 27 books, he wrote them wrote four of them, the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, while in prison. And sometimes God will just set you down because he wants you to learn how to trust him through the fire. But thankfully for us, 2,000 years later, we have Ephesians, Philippians, my favorite verse passage, excuse me, favorite book of the Bible. The, the book of Philippians, 16 times Paul writes it from prison. He says, be joyful, be joyful, be joyful, be joyful which tells me there's no circumstance I can find myself where in Christ I can sing. I can be joyful. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians is the most uh, powerful book that preaches and teaches the deity of Christ. By him, all things consist. It, it pleased God to let the fullness of the Godhead dwell in Jesus in bodily form. By him, all things exist. He, he is the exact representation of God. You want to know what God looks like? Look at Jesus. And then Philemon, 25 little verses about an escaped slave who's been told by Paul, who meets him in Rome, to go back. But when he comes back, accept him as a brother, not as a slave. And if he owes you anything, charge it to my account. I'll make it right. Receive him as a brother, not as a slave, which I promise you turned the Roman world on its ear because there was over 60 million slaves in Rome. It's just a reminder that God used Paul to write such depth, such meaning, and tonight's message is no exception. It's powerful. He is a lifelong learner. He asked for the parchments. He asked for <clears throat> the scrolls, most likely copies of the Old Testament. Isn't that fascinating? So even an apostle needs to learn. As you know, Ben, you're surrounded by books. Your dad's been a lifelong reader. My mother told me, who's was watching but tonight probably, she said when I was a little kid, she'd find books around, dog-eared, around under the couch, different books I'm working on, and that's been the case. I, I used to tell my sons when they were little, readers are leaders. Remember me saying that to you? Readers are leaders. You're the same person you'll be in five years with two exceptions, the people you know and the books you read. Paul is hungry for God's word, most likely copies of the Old Testament that were incredibly valuable to him. 
Maybe he was still working on some things, but we know that Second Timothy is his last book that he will write. It's really amazing. Don't quit learning, folks. Never think you've arrived. Keep on studying to show yourself approved, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, after he segues from a, a warm coat and some reading material to read most likely by candlelight, he reminds the folks of someone who was an enemy to the early church. Alexander, the coppersmith, did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. We don't know what he did. Uh, most likely, he, um, as a coppersmith, he probably made idols. And when Paul uh, pointed people to Jesus and people got saved, the idol uh, copper business kind of suffered. Reminds me of uh, when Jesus lands on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee and he's confronted by the Gadarene demoniac possessed by 6,000 evil entities. <clears throat> the Lord heals him. He's uh, without clothes. He spends a night in the graveyard, cuts himself, no steel fetters, nothing could hold him. And the next time you see him, he's clothed, sitting in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. And then he wants to go with Jesus. Jesus doesn't let him go. He says, you got to stay here and tell people what I did. And the Bible says that's what he did. But people wanted Jesus to leave. Scottish preacher Peter Marshall said, if people prefer pigs to his company, he doesn't press the point. He gets in the boat, the wind fills the sails, and the boat leaves as silently as it came. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ will damn a human being to hell forever. That's why it's so important to draw nigh unto him when he speaks to you about faith and repentance and forgiveness and relationship. Say yes, yes, yes. And um, getting back to my George Truett quote that I think I forgot to tell folks. He said, if I had a thousand lifetimes, I'd give every one of them to Jesus. So would I. Every time. So he says, watch out for this guy. He's real trouble. Uh, the message puts it this way. Watch out for Alexander the coppersmith. Fiercely opposed our marriage, he, um, our message. He caused no end of trouble. God will give him what he's got coming. So Paul knew. Uh, in fact, the Bible says, and uh, I believe it's 2 Thessalonians, God will trouble those who trouble you. So folks, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Don't take that into your own hands. Um, <laughs> it's like what the agent Rogers said. When he's criticized, when he was criticized, he said, I just tell Jesus on him. <laughs> That's what I do. I just tell Jesus on him, right? Um, so he says, uh, at my first defense, no one supported me, all deserted me. He knew what it was to be uh, lonely. And then this incredible addition, may it not be held against them. That's real forgiveness. R.T. Kendall in his book, Total Forgiveness, said you can tell when you've really forgiven someone when you can pray for them and really want God to bless them. Yeah, that's what Paul models here. I've been deserted. They walked out on me. I don't want that to be held against him, Lord. Do you know when you forgive someone, you set a prisoner free, and you find out the prisoner was yourself? Forgiveness is expected. We need to forgive because we've been so richly forgiven. But the Lord stood with me, strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and all the Gentiles might hear. That's us. Because Paul was faithful. He wanted to go east. God sent him west. Started the church at Philippi, according to the book of Acts. I think around Acts chapter 17. That was the first church in the European continent. Would you? Well, of course, you know this. You know where our people come from, right? I always thought we were more Irish than anything else. But what did I find out in a DNA test? Do you remember? We're more Scandinavian. We're, we're the Vikings. Rrr. <laughs> could you just see me with those big antlers? You can? Yeah. I can see you that way. So <laughs> the funny thing about that is I was 19% Scandinavian, the Norsemen, and about 17% Irish, and then a whole lot of other stuff. Who knows? Other nationalities. But Paul went to Philippi, and the gospel first church in Europe infiltrated all of Europe other churches starting, the, the, the fire of evangelism, drawing people to Christ. I could trace my salvation to Paul's effort, most likely, in Philippi. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> so he says, um, 
He says, I was rescued out of the lion's mouth here. Isn't that interesting? I liked what uh, Tony Evans said about that. It's, he said, it may either refer metaphorically to evil people like Emperor Nero or literally to the wild animals that killed Christians in the Roman Colosseum. In Hebrews 11, you'll read about the early Christians. Some of them didn't have a place to, to live. They lived in caves. They were so, sawed in half. Some think that's how Isaiah died, uh, the Old Testament prophet, uh, sawed in half. What they used to do in the Roman Colosseum is they would uh, put animal skins on, er, on Christians, our brothers and sisters in Christ, turn them loose in the arena and let wild animals rip them to shreds. That's the kind, their blood staining the floor of the Colosseum. And remember this, the blood of the martyrs is the seedbed of the church. God's work goes on. That same George W. Truett said this once. He said, the workmen die, the workmen move on, but the work goes on. And it does. No matter what befall us, he is our king and our Lord. And Paul says, he will rescue me from every, every difficulty here. That's pretty powerful. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed, will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I tell people all the time, God hasn't promised us a safe journey. The road of life is bumpy. I'll be talking about that Sunday in a message from Romans 8, that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The road of life is bumpy. Sometimes it's scary. And say and promised us a safe journey, but he's promised us a safe landing. And one of these days I will depart to be with Christ, which Paul said is better by far. And so will you. Greet Prisca and Aquila. That's Priscilla and Aquila. <clears throat> they were also uh, itinerant ministers of the gospel. Both were tent makers like Paul. And they first met uh, because they were... Uh, exiled out of Rome because of their faith in Christ. They met, if I remember right, in Corinth, and they became fast friends. Some believe that Priscilla and Aquila, these uh, husband and wife tent makers, were the ones who discipled Apollos. Some believe Apollos wrote the book of Hebrews because no one knows who wrote the Hebrews letter. Uh, someone said only God knows who wrote Hebrews. <laughs> but they believe just possibly that Priscilla and Aquila uh, discipled Apollos, who was known to be mighty in the word, we know that they taught him more about Jesus. Is there a better thing than that, that your life points others to him? Greet Prisca and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth. Trophius, I left sick at Miletus. Here's what it says in the message. Say hello to Priscilla and Aquila, also the family of Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus was the one who searched hard for Paul in the early passage of, uh, I think, of 2 Timothy chapter 1 and uh, looked hard to find him. He was a real friend. And um, here he, he says, greet the household. Some believe that Onesiphorus, I always say Onesiphorus, some pronounce it Onesiphorus, actually died for his loyalty to Paul. And so now he says, I'm greeting the household, right? He doesn't greet him, but the household, meaning he possibly had passed away. Make every effort to come before winter. Oh, but let me back up. Uh, he talks about Trophimus, I left sick at Miletus. Um, that's a reminder to me that sometimes God doesn't always heal physically like we ask him to. Trophius was a follower of Christ. Paul loved him, great devoted follower of the Lord. But he left him sick in Miletus. Uh, by inference, looking at the text, we can conclude that sometimes God doesn't always heal us physically. Sometimes leaders, followers of Christ at the highest level, can be subjected to illness. It's a misnomer to believe that Jesus will heal us from all physical ailments. He can. His power is not limited to. But if the storm makes me more, more like him, let the rain fall, Tony Ellenberg wrote years ago. Sometimes we have an affliction to keep us closer to Jesus. Paul three times asked God to remove this issue that he had. Some believe it might have been malaria. Some people might believe it might have been poor eyesight. But he said three times, please remove the thorn from me. Basically, this affliction. We don't know what it was. Every time you know what the Lord said to him, Ben? My grace is sufficient for you. And so it is. 
not easy walking these roads of life, but we know where they lead in Jesus to a brand new beginning, not so far around the corner. <clears throat> Make every effort to come before winter. Why? It's cold in Rome in the winter. I need my Coke. I need that. But don't, hey, one, don't forget my reading materials. An apostle always has to read. Leaders are readers. Readers are leaders. Benjamin, remember that. Try hard to get before here before winter. Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all your friends here send greetings. All of them say, hey. Isn't that interesting? Names from the past. Names from history. The sands of time have covered their influence. But Paul remembered it. And he's allowed us to remember them. One day I anticipate we'll meet Pudens and Linus and Claudia. And all the brethren. A lot of those are Greek names. Which tells us the Lord's Holy Spirit was moving in the life of Paul through the prison. Prison guards were getting saved. Probably telling their friends, their loved ones. The gospel goes forth, goes on. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Final words from the pen of the most dynamic apostle who ever drew a breath. Full of hope, full of joy. <coughs> Tradition says <clears throat> the apostle Paul was beheaded out on the Astinian Way outside of Rome. As a Roman citizen, he could not be executed within the city limits. Tradition says he was beheaded. A slash, a flash. Then he beheld him then face to face. A lot to look forward to, wouldn't you say? I've enjoyed Second Timothy with you. I hope that you have. I know that you have. How could we not? Soaking in the words of this brilliant apostle to a young preacher in Ephesus. We get to peek over the shoulder as Paul writes his obituary tonight. No tears. If there are, tears of joy, tears of anticipation, tears of hope. It's like the old Stephen Curtis Chapman song. When we grieve, we let go with hope. Great to be with you tonight. I hope that you have a wonderful evening. I'm continuing <clears throat> a study through the lives of the very people that attend this church. Sunday, we had strong attendance. We had children Sunday. It was wonderful. And great days ahead, but I miss seeing you. Come back soon. Find your pew. Claim it. And celebrate the risen Lord Jesus Christ with us this coming Lord's Day. As I preach from the book of Romans, chapter 8, 37 through 39. And the reminder that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In Him, we're more than conquerors. Paul found that to be true. So will you and I, when our time to depart comes. Lord, I thank you so much for the privilege to be with your people tonight. Bless them, meet all their needs according to the riches by glory in Christ Jesus. Draw them to you. Draw them to your word. Let them be people of the book, full of faith and joy, unspeakable, full of glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good evening, folks. Thanks for watching.